Uh, good afternoon, good afternoon colleagues in the room and good afternoon to all colleagues connected online because this event is hybrid. My name is Julio Pinto. I am uh, working in FAO in the Animal Production and Health Division with the One Health and Disease Control Branch and based in the FAO office in Geneva. We have, we have today a distinguished group of uh, speakers that will uh, cover different issues related to One Health implementation and, and to participate in this event on One Health approach to strengthen pandemic prevention and preparedness. Um, we have colleagues connected online and at the end of the event, we will have also some time for a short discussions and some of the questions from the audience. But let's start uh, with the introduction and the welcome remarks from Buddy Bespes, uh, officer in charge of the uh, Animal Production and Health Division. Uh, Buddy, please, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julio. Uh, dear participants, on behalf of the Assistant Director General and the Director of the Animal Production and Health Division, I'm very pleased to welcome you today at this side event on one health approach to strengthen pandemic prevention and preparedness. The side event is co-organized by FAO, Zodiac, the Joint FAO IE Zoonotic Disease Integrated Action. Sorry, sorry buddy, can you be close to the microphone? Because, oh. okay. Thank you. Okay, I repeat. Yeah. The side event is co-organized by FAO, Zodiac, the Joint FAO IE Zoonotic Disease Integrated Action, and PRIZOD, the Preventing Zoonotic Disease Emergence Initiative. Many of you are engaged in One Health practices, which are essential to prevent, detect, and control infectious zoonotic diseases and antimicrobial resistance. The One Health approach is embedded in the FAO strategic framework and its four betters, better nutrition, better production, better nutrition, better environment, and better life. It's also embedded in the sustainable livestock transformation framework. Colleagues, the world is facing public health emergencies at increasing frequency and scale. Low and middle income countries are with limited capacities are at a higher risk of infectious diseases spreading more widely and faster, leading to a greater social, economic, and health inequalities. The global impact of the COVID-19 pandemic is well known to all. And the surge in avian influenza, MERS-CoV, and recent MPOX cases in a human population in and outside Africa calls for a coordinated global support to better prepare and respond to pandemic threats. Recognizing the ever growing threat in infectious diseases, the pandemic fund was launched by the G20 in 2022 as a multilateral financing mechanism to provide grants to strengthen the capacity of countries in need to better prevent, prepare, and respond to future pandemic threats. I'm pleased that FAO has been accredited as one of the implementing entities to help our members in the formulation and implementation of pandemic fund projects. Through the pandemic fund, FAO aims to further strengthen the capacity of its members for effective prevention, early warning, surveillance, early detection, and rapid response to zoonotic uh, diseases and antimicrobial resistance. FAO is currently co-leading the implementation of 12 pandemic fund projects to boost collaborative surveillance, laboratory capacity, and human resource development. We are doing that in partnership with other implementing entities like WHO, UNICEF, 
the World Bank, and the Asian Development Bank. Colleagues, today we will hear from our members about best practices and lessons learned during the formulation and implementation of pandemic fund projects. Thank you, Ethiopia and Nepal, for accepting our invitation and sharing your experiences. The side event brings also together participants involved in One Health implementation with a leading scientist from the One Health research. We hope that this event will help identify key strategic elements to guide our work on zoonotic disease management and pandemic prevention under the FAO Sustainable Livestock Transformation and One Health and Agri-Food Systems for Global Health and Food Security. Thank you very much for being with us. And once again, welcome to our esteemed guest. I wish you all an interactive session. I look forward to the outcome of this session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Badi, for uh, highlighting the, the integration of One Health in the FAO strategic framework and the livestock transformation framework, and also the role of the pandemic fund in, in leveraging some funding and support to countries to implement a pandemic prevention, preparedness, and response. Thank you very much, Vadi, for, for your welcome remarks. Now we, we give the floor to uh, Selalem Tadese, Senior Animal Health Officer with the Animal Production and Health Division. And Selalem will present on the One Health in Agri-Food System Transformation for Strengthening Global Health Security. Selalem, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julio. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you very much for joining this uh, side event. I will provide an overview about FAO's work on One Health for uh, global health and food security. So I think as some of you know, FAO has been really advancing the One Health approach uh, over the last several decades. And it has taken also a very concrete step to mainstream the One Health approach into the agri-food systems uh, through identifying the one Health as one of the 20 program priority areas of its current program uh, strategic framework. Uh, through the One Health BPA, we really uh, aim to strengthen early warning and surveillance systems, prevent and mitigate health risks through improved biosecurity, uh, improve preparedness and response capacities to emergencies, as well as scaling up actions against AMR and strengthen One Health systems. Now, I'm not sure if, yeah, okay. So uh, apart from our corporate strategic framework, FUS work on One Health is also guided and contributes to the quadripartite One Health Joint Plan of Action, which was developed some two years uh, ago, and also aims to promote actions against zoonotic diseases, AMR, food safety threats, through improving and the capacity of health systems, as well as better integration of the environment sector into uh, One Health. So now, uh, in the coming few slides, I would like really to briefly highlight what FEO's actions are to promote global health and food security through our work in the animal health sector. As you know, over the years, FEO has been supporting members to strengthen uh, the capacity of uh, early warning and surveillance uh, for animal diseases through improving passive uh, surveillance systems and uh, detection of diseases, as well as active surveillance systems and epidemiological studies uh, aimed toward this high impact uh, zoonotic diseases and also other transboundary animal diseases. 
Of course, we also, as part of the overall systems improvement, we also support building of early detection capability of national and regional laboratories through various interventions and initiatives, such as the Global Health Security Program and also the recently launched uh, Pandemic Fund. Now, uh, as part of the overall systems strengthening in the animal health sector, we also support members to strengthen the technical capacity of uh, animal health workforce uh, in various core competency areas, including surveillance, diagnostics, risk assessment, and also uh, outbreak investigation and disease control. Of course, involving also last, last mile service providers through blended and also uh, tailor-made training programs, such as uh, ISAVET, VPP, and FETPV. In addition, FU has been providing enormous support to our members to mitigate and respond to outbreaks of high impact zoonotic diseases and also transboundary animal diseases over the years. I think uh, you can see from this map that various support have been provided in various geographical areas to mitigate uh, outbreaks of high impact diseases. Of course, at FEO, we also foster collaboration and partnership with key partners at global, regional, and national levels with a view to promote and advocate for mainstreaming of the One Health approach in key policies, strategies, and also relevant instruments, including you know, main uh, work streams uh, in the agri-food system. Lastly, uh, as a way forward, uh, in order to, to consolidate, streamline, and also scale up our support to our members, we have initiated development of additional corporate frameworks, which include under the overall umbrella of the agri-food systems transformation for the four borders, which include sustainable livestock transformation framework, as well as the One Health in agri food system for global health and food security. Of course, we have also embarked on development of key strategies, including animal health workforce strategy, as well as uh, a strategy for prevention and uh, management of zoonotic diseases, particularly at the animal source and also along the food chain. Uh, we look forward to collaborate with each one of you to support the finalization and further implementation of these strategies in the interest and to benefit our members. Uh, and with this, I thank you, Chair, over. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah Lem. I think from your presentation, there are very important keywords. One is collaboration. One Hell is about collaboration. One Hell is about coordination. Investment, because you mentioned some of the program that FAO is uh, implementing in, in, in countries, uh, particularly the Global Health Security Program, through the ECTAD program, uh, the pandemic fund implementation, and also the relevant coordination among the quadripartite uh, collaboration. I think this is also a very important point from your presentation. And finally, you highlighted the, the role of the workforce development, which is a very important area of work, uh, in particular, uh, creating and strengthening workforce development capacities in all sectors, not only in the human health sector, but also in the animal health sector and environmental sector. I think, thank you, Selalem, for your presentation. And we move to the next presenter, which is uh, Biscam. We, if I pronounce well, Biscan Wille Warnda from the Joint FAOIA Collaboration Center, CGN. And Biscan will present us on the activities of Zodiac uh, for prevention, preparedness, and response to zoonosis. Biscan, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. Uh, distinguished guests, uh, dear colleagues, all of you who have come here. Um, good afternoon to you. 
and thank you very much for inviting the Joint Center to present um, the, our activities on the Zodiac Initiative, uh, a flagship initiative from the International Atomic Energy Agency. Oh, sorry. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> um, so we are talking about the pathogen spillover in this project. So pathogen spillover between host species triggers infectious disease outbreaks with the ecosystem. Okay. Yeah. So with the ecosystem boundary areas being suggested as hotspots. So if we concentrate on these hotspots. There we can um, do early intervention so that we don't need to um, act late when the outbreaks are getting bigger and bigger. So what is Zodiac? Zodiac is a zoonotic disease integrated action. It's an IEA initiative to increase um, zoonotic uh, disease detection, diagnostic, diagnosis, and monitoring capacities. And um, one thing is to note is the using nuclear and nuclear derived technologies in this um, initiative. And Zodiac is built upon um, IES past experiences on wet lab network, which was um, which is a network between uh, veterinary lab networks, uh, veterinary labs in um, countries in Africa and Asia. And Zodiac is, is built upon uh, five pillars. And the pillars are, the, the pillar number one is um, capacity building in member states for detection, diagnosis, and monitoring capabilities. And indeed, we know in order to perform this, we need to develop novel technologies which are cost effective and um, user friendly. So. Pillar number two is about research and development for novel technologies. And then we need to know, um, we have to share these technologies among our members. So that's about pillar three, it's IT-based information sharing. And pillar four is on uh, the um, data and nuclear applications for human health. Uh, one thing to note, pillar one, two, and three are relevant and responsibilities of the Joint Center of Nuclear and Nuclear um, nuclear Technologies in Food and Agriculture. Um, and pillar number four is, is belonging to another uh, different department within IEA. And pillar five is a coordinated action of involving all these pillars. And if you look at what we have done is, is is the first step is to um, initiate uh, the the um, member states to have national coordinators for this Zodiac project, and we have Zodiac national coordinators, and along with that we have Zodiac national laboratories, the laboratories which have been recognized to um, take the lead in uh, one health approach in combating. Uh, the uh, zoonotic diseases. Up to now, 150 member states have nominated their Zodiac national coordinators, and 180, 128 member states have nominated Zodiac national laboratories. And during this process, we have helped the member states um, in terms of uh, diagnostic capabilities. As you can see in this map, it uh, is spread all over the world. Some of them have been supplied with uh, technologies to um, diagnose diseases using molecular and serological techniques. And some of the advanced laboratories have been supplied with uh, capabilities for um, genome sequencing. And uh, just as my um, colleague mentioned, human resource development is, is a key component in um, making member states uh, able to um, fend off the next 
pandemic. So in that aspect, what we are doing is we are doing uh, regional training courses and we are conducting uh, coordinated meetings. We have done a uh, number of workshops to address um, emerging and re-emerging uh, diseases. Uh, and then we do a fellowship training. And uh, of course, we go to uh, these member states and then follow up with their activities through expert missions. And then we have consultant meetings where we bring people who are the um, world leaders on these uh, activities and then uh, help the member states through this initiative. And we have an um, IT um, platform, which we call iVetNet. It's a cloud-based uh, information platform where member states uh, or the laboratories and even um, all the stakeholders are able to access the, um, the updated uh, SOPs um, so that they are able to perform disease diagnostics in an efficient manner. So, so uh, in order to do these activities, as I mentioned in the beginning, we have to do the development of novel technologies. For us, it's very important. Uh, myself, representing the uh, laboratory, uh, Animal Production and Health Laboratory, we take the lead in uh, developing these kind of technologies. And within these technologies, uh, there are five key areas that we try to address. One thing is um, developing sampling technologies uh, so that we, we don't miss the, uh, the, uh, the pathogen which are um, circulating in, in let's say in animal reservoirs so that it has the potential to jump into human population. And then we have detection uh, technologies which are cost uh, effective so that it can be used by uh, member states where resources are less. And then we support member states to uh, characterize because it's not only important that we detect, but we need to characterize in order to find the, the source of uh, the pathogens and where it will go next. And uh, the next step is we, we try to harmonize so that the technology is developed, uh, used by one, one member states and another member states uh, have the same kind of uh, approach, uh, same kind of uh, parameters that they use so that they don't uh, report differently. And finally, we, we try to transfer these technologies to member states as early as possible. Uh, around this, uh, to develop these technologies, we have developed uh, four coordinated research projects. Uh, and it's important to highlight here because these four uh, coordinated research projects uh, are um, addressing four regions because each region has its own um, priorities and own um, way of doing things. So we have considered those things in when we develop these coordinated research projects. And uh, what we have now, up, although we have developed these four coordinated research projects, uh, the coordinated research project for Asia and Pacific is the one which is funded and it's in operation. And in within this project, we have three technical uh, contracts. A technical contract is uh, is a contract where we develop a very specific technology to address a specific uh, point. And then we have six research contracts uh, to um, evaluate these technologies and to fine tune uh, the technologies. And the pillar three is under development and it's about uh, uh, making a tool that will help us to make real-time decisions uh, so that we can make timely interventions. So I thank you all for listening to um, our activities on Sodia. Thank you very much. Thank you, Biscan, for being on time and and also to to describe the um, the activities of Zodiac supporting countries in in particular in the detection of pathogens and support to laboratories in different in different regions our next speaker uh, is um, arno bataille from ciudad from presot and arno will present us on presot in action and how this program is strengthening pandemic prevention capacities from local 
to global, not from global to local. <laughs> yes, good good afternoon, everybody. So on behalf of Prezod members and Sierra, I will present first uh, what is Prezod and then goes into really the concrete actions that have been, uh, been implemented uh, through Prezod. So uh, first, really, uh, what's central to uh, Prezod is that we want to go towards a change in, in paradigm so that prevention of pandemics is actually going from bottom up to using uh, one else approaches. And um, in, in really our aims is first to uh, have a common scientific framework to implement and coordinate uh, research projects, have a platform for data sharing, and uh, also have resource centers for uh, for decision making on the, to reduce the risk of emerging uh, zoonosis. Uh, for the moment, we have up to 250 uh, members in the Preserved Initiative, representing uh, over 77 countries and uh, 27 member countries and two overseas territories that are uh, uh, really part of this initiative. Uh, it's important to, non to note that we have an international governance with uh, a presidency uh, from uh, Senegal and, and Thailand uh, currently. Uh, so now uh, to go into activities uh, within Prezod. Uh, first, now we have a, a database that's been developed that is kind of uh, gathering all uh, one else initiative done uh, to prevent emerging uh, risks. For the moment, we have up to 400 uh, initiatives that have been uh, identified, but the work is ongoing. More will be uh, included in this database uh, up for, um, for everybody to, to explore. We have uh, a data working group that is identifying the, uh, identifying the critical uh, data types to be uh, included in, in, uh, in, in, in those research. And uh, we have a lot of advocacy uh, actions, notably uh, through joint uh, working groups with international organizations, uh, no notably FAO and, and uh, OA, and working a lot uh, at the highest level uh, to promote uh, prevention of, of pandemics. Of course, uh, a lot of the present actions are based on uh, capacity building actions, notably to strengthen uh, expertise in uh, disease diagnosis, in epidemiology, in risk analysis, one else through online and, and enhanced uh, courses. Some are within the present actions, but also it's done in synergy with other institutions and other actions, notably uh, through the FAO reference centers uh, actions uh, and other platforms. We have a, a very important platform called PRISM with uh, a wide variety of online courses available, not only really about one else. And uh, important to know that we have a, we will have a new master, one else master course uh, that will start in Cameroon also in, in 2025. But if we want to go into the concrete actions that are going on in the field with communities, uh, should here present uh, PREACTS, which is the first operational program within the Prezod initiative. It has three phases. Uh, I'm going to focus here on the first phase called uh, AFRICAM, with projects going on in Cameroon, Guinea, Madagascar, Senegal, and, and Cambodia. Um, first, most of the actions with PREACTS are about building an early warning system to detect zoonotic risks through the development of community-based integrated uh, surveillance systems. So it's really like the, the central tenet is going towards community-based surveillance systems. Here uh, in, in Madagascar, it's, it's being done through uh, multiple uh, approaches, including uh, environmental modeling and uh, uh, policy um, uh, di dialogues, like uh, public policy dialogues. But also interestingly, in, in, in Guinea, we go towards the development of a uh, community-based system using participatory approach, really co-designing with the communities those systems and using notably innovative tools, such as the 
uh, alert, uh, alert serious game has been developed uh, with uh, WOA under the EBOSERSI project. Beyond PREACT, uh, we have uh, other community-based surveillance system projects that are within the PRISO network, uh, notably uh, the, in Gabon, the SWIM program, with also many members of the communities that are being trained and involved in surveillance systems with a lot of uh, field uh, sampling being done and uh, new communication means delivered to actors of the system, not only smartphones and tablets. And, and this type of projects, new types of uh, projects are being developed in in other countries from Cambodia to, to Zimbabwe. The list is here on the left of the slide. Lastly, I want to mention uh, actions that are really uh, transversal to all the preserved action. It's about uh, state, science, society, dialogue and public uh, policies. Uh, we work on that notably uh, in, in Senegal, uh, not, uh, where we do an, an analysis of the current framework about for One Health and uh, work towards strengthening the, the, the dialogue platforms at the local, regional and national level. In, in Madagascar, we are working towards scaling up this community-based uh, surveillance system at a national level and uh, at a more like a global scale, we 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 review uh, the the one health status of of different uh, countries and, uh, and propose a, a literature review on the state science society dialogue concepts in the one health sectors. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Arnot, for this very nice and overview of uh, the Presod work and also to bring to bring to the table the, the issue of how to implement One Health at the community level. I think this is a very critical factor for One Health implementation, how we engage and how we involve communities in the in, in finding also solutions for their problems, for their issues. And and I think this is a very important and to remind us on the on the participatory approaches, and I think these are have been uh, one of the success factors in many many disease control programs and eradication programs. That you need to go through these participatory approaches to really involve communities in finding the the solutions for disease outbreaks, in particular uh, in eradication of some important diseases. Participatory disease surveillance has been playing a very important role in finding the last cases, no of 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 diseases and i think this is a, a very important for for uh, zoonotic uh, outbreaks and, and potential pandemics and again um, i think you also highlighted the partnership and collaboration i think presot uh, is a very good example of this multi partnership and good collaboration at all levels not only at the global level but also at the regional country and, and national level thank you thank you very much um Next presenter and next um, speaker is, uh, we move now to investment, a very important topic, investment on, on, on One Health and how we can support countries in uh, implementing One Health plans and implementation of pandemic prevention, preparedness and response. We have Samuel Mills from the World Bank, uh, Pandemic Fund Secretariat, and Samuel will present on some aspect of the pandemic fund and, and what is going on with the pandemic fund now? Thank you, Samuel. Please, you have the floor. I'll give an overview of the uh, pandemic uh, fund. Um, as we are all aware, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, caught nearly all countries flat-footed. Um, and this underscored the devastating human, economic, and social cost of unpreparedness. Um, it's become apparent that uh, modest investment in pandemic uh, prepare, prevention, preparedness, and response would go a long way to avert uh, future uh, pandemics. 
it is against this background and this backdrop and um under the auspice of the g20 the pandemic fund was established in september 2022 20, uh, it is the um only multi uh, multilateral financing mechanism and that is geared towards investing in pandemic PPR uh, capacities in low and middle income countries. The fund's vision is for everyone to be uh, protected from the risk of pandemics. And the objective is to uh, provide dedicated stream of financing, long-term financing for investments and technical support to improve uh, pandemic PPR in various countries. The financing is catalytic. What it means is that um, with the projects that are being financed by the uh, pandemic fund, it is expected that they will leverage resources from other uh, development partners and also from domestic resources. And the fund developed the strategic a five year strategic plan um, this year. And the three programmatic priorities are one, um, improving or strengthening surveillance systems, two, um, strengthen laboratory systems, and then um, enhancing uh, workforce and uh, pandemic PPR capacity. There are four cross cutting themes. An important one is what the One Health approach, which we are discussing here today. All the projects that are financed by the pandemic fund are expected to invest in or improve uh, One Health. The other cross-cutting themes are community engagement, gender equality, and health equity. And there are also two cross-cutting enablers to ensure that there's coordination at the national level as well as the uh, regional level. This is a busy slide and it shows the theory, uh, theory of change for the uh, pandemic fund. I wouldn't go into everything for the sake of time, but the impact ambition is that uh, countries and regional and global networks are better prepared to prevent, detect, contain and rapidly respond to pandemics. There are four main uh, results areas. One is improved capacity uh, for detection, notification, and response to pandemics. The second is uh, fostering coordination at the national level, regional level, and the global uh, level. The third is incentivizing additional investments in pandemic PPR, that is a leveraging of additional resources. And the fourth is improved efficiency in the use of the pandemic fund uh, resources. If you look on the last, at the bottom, you will see advancement of the cross-cutting themes that I mentioned. One Health is one of them in all the pandemic fund um, activities. So every year, the uh, projects are supposed to submit um, annual progress reports, and they have to uh, report on or present a narrative on what they have done to improve uh, one health in the various uh, countries. We had the first round of grants last year. Uh, we had about 170 proposals for 140 countries. It was very competitive process. It had to go through an independent technical advisory panel. And then eventually the board um, approved 19 of the proposals. This includes some multi-country original proposals. So about, about 37 countries were supported in the first round. Some of them have just started, um, started the implementation. In the second round, um, it closed in May, and then sometime next month, the board would approve the second round of projects. We have implementing entities that are actually supporting the countries 
in the implementation of these projects. And as was mentioned earlier, FAO um, is an implementing entity in 12 of the 19 projects and that was approved um, last year. Last week, um, there is a pox um, epidemic, as some of you may know, in Africa. And the board approved um, 129 million for 10 countries um, to support them with the MPOX. And of those projects, um, FAO, again, um, is going to be the implementing entity for, for four of those projects. So FAO is doing very well. And we are hoping that since FAO is part of the, is one of the implementing entities, they will help to uh, foster one the One Health approach in the various uh, projects. Um, as I indicated earlier, we expect the projects, all the projects to report on the One Health approach. It was this year that the strategic uh, plan was developed. So it was a mandatory for um, the projects that were approved last year. And nevertheless, uh, we requested the projects to just report to us what are some of the activities that they've undertaken regarding one health approach. And as you can see, um, nearly all the projects reported that they have some activities that are looking at the interconnectedness between uh, um, human health, animal health, and environmental health. Some of the projects are investing in capacity building regarding One Health, and over half of them indicated that there's strong collaboration between the ministries of health and the ministries of agriculture. Bhutan, for example, uh, reported that um, they've established an interministerial committee for One Health. They meet regularly, and there are several activities that um, they are undertaking. They've done a joint risk assessment, prioritization, and implementation. We hope that in the coming months, we'll hear more about some of the activities that have been undertaken in the various projects. But we are pleased to have on the panel uh, Ethiopia and Nepal that will share their experience on what they have done so far regarding One Health. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Samuel, for presenting the, the pandemic fund and, and, and what is the status of the implementation of the pandemic fund with the first round, with the special allocation for MPOX, and for the next uh, second round that will be announced very soon, uh, the selection of the project that will be uh, granted. Um, I think the pandemic fund has, has, has been demonstrating that the the, the encouragement to international organizations and to regional and, and local governments, national governments to work together, uh, finding uh, common solutions for pandemic uh, preparedness and, and response and, and to work on some of these uh, uh, issues related to workforce development, strengthening laboratory capacities and surveillance for uh, zoonotic uh, emerging diseases, then I think uh, th these are very good news and and we hope that in the future we will have more support for countries to to continue the implementation of the One Health approach. Uh, our next, uh, um, we have two speakers now that will um, share with us some concrete experience on how they are uh, um, implementing the, the One Health approach uh, through the pandemic fund project implementation. We will have our first speaker from Ethiopia, Dr. Alemayu Mekonen Ambesi, uh, and then we will have Dr. Umesh Dahal from Nepal, uh, that they will speak on the experience on the pandemic fund implementation. Dr. Alemayu, you have seven, seven minutes because we need to finish on time. Thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers of this uh, forum for giving the opportunity to my country to be part of uh, this forum. As uh, you are well informed that Ethiopia is one of the uh, countries secured the pandemic fund. 
and the uh, EPPR project utilized the One Health institutional platform led by the ministers of health, agriculture, and to enhance the implementation of existing agreements among the stakeholders. Uh, this initiative focuses uh, on integrated human, animal, and environmental health and to address the health challenges and effectively. Uh, the project has already established a management structure, including the JCC, that's the Joint Coordination Committee, and the Steering Committee below. Uh, the upper one is for decision making, especially higher officials at the level of uh, state ministers and permanent secretaries. And the third level, there is the technical working group, uh, mainly uh, technical working group for surveillance, technical working group for uh, uh, laboratories and uh, workforce development uh, on One Health engagements. Uh, the GCC is called by the Ministry of uh, Health uh, uh, in collaboration with the World Organization for uh, uh, World Health Organization. It's a high-level committee that meets quarterly to review projects and to endorse those uh, issues uh, brought to the attention of the GCC. At this, uh, as, uh, the level for decision making. Uh, and below there is a steering committee comprising representatives from various ministries like Ministry of Health, uh, Ministry of Agriculture, WHO, FAO, UNICEF. They are all uh, members of the steering committee. It means mandatory uh, to ensure effective implementation and address any arising challenges by the technical working groups. So the technical working groups, as I've already mentioned, this. Uh, there are three uh, uh, working groups. The one is for laboratory, the other is for workforce development, and the third one is for uh, surveillance. So uh, they are aligned with the technical standards and the joint annual work plan. They are working in close collaboration. So key partners include, yeah, uh, it's already mentioned, uh, there are, apart from Ministry of Health and Ministry of Agriculture, we have Arman uh, Hansa Research Institute and Ethiopian Public Health Institute, Ethiopian Food and Drug Administration Institute uh, Authority, IFDA, and the Animal Health Institute, and the Ethiopian Agricultural Authority, and uh, civil societies organizations are also part of uh this uh program and also some uh, acad uh representing academia there are uh, universities uh this this bring experts in workforce development surveillance and laboratory and capacity on zoonotic disease especially focusing on the amr so the project is led by the Ministry of Health with a significant contribution from the Ministry of Agriculture and the consortium. The consortium is the UN agencies, that's FAO, WHO, UNICEF, and it focuses on their areas of expertise. Uh, mainly, uh, WHO manages most laboratory activities, while FAO is uh, overseas on zoonotic and veterinary-related workers uh, development and uh, UNICEF mainly focus on community engagement. So uh, mode of implementation, mainly through letter of uh, agreement between Ministry of Agriculture and the uh, FAO. Uh, engagements of uh, NGOs is planned for the next year. Uh, we will identify it based on the criteria set to uh, select uh, partners. Uh, with laboratories already procurement of uh, critical laboratory equipment is going on. Uh, workforce development, currently about 15 members and 80 government staff trained under the ESABET in service applied veterinary, uh, uh, veterinary epidemiology training in collaboration with the Addis Ababa University, College of Agriculture and Veterinary Medicine. Uh, with surveillance, we have already, uh, there are uh, ongoing preparatory work establishments in integrated uh, electronic reporting alert system. Uh, with project management, there are a number of efforts going on, like uh, recruitment of additional support staff is almost completed uh, with the position field like a project manager and national epidemiologist and so on.
that's all I have. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Alemayu, for uh, this overview on, on the ongoing process of the pandemic fund implementation in Ethiopia and the decision, the political decision from the government to have this uh, coordination mechanism at the country level. And, and also you mentioned the importance of civil society and how also this sector and different organizations are included in the in the discussions and in the implementation of this of this pandemic fund uh, implementation process. Uh, thank you very much. Now we have the privilege to to have a, a, our speaker from Nepal, Dr. Umesh Dahal, uh, that also he will share some experience from Nepal on the pandemic fund implementation. The floor is yours, Dr. Umesh. Yeah, thank you, thank you, sir. A respected chair of this session, a dignitary on the dais and on the room. Dear de delegates, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to be here as a part of this conference. On behalf of government of Nepal and on my own as a CBO of Nepal, I'd like to thank AFU headquarters for providing this opportunity. So, yeah, I'll try my best to finish my presentation on time. With the rest of the time, is, uh, uh, so I have some slides from introductory slides. So livestock sector contributes to around 10% of the national GDP with huge per capita livestock population. As far as the frequent disease outbreak is concerned, avian influenza, both HPI and LPI and other genetic diseases, yeah, we are facing. Transport animal diseases, the, the FMD and PPI, they are endemic, but we do have, uh, we are conducting national disease control program in order to control these diseases within three years. So, and some emerging diseases like uh, lumpy skin disease and African swine fever. So, we can have such type of diseases. Among the prioritized infectious diseases in public health, there are in total 52. Among them, 27 are of genetic origin. So, notifiable uh, disease in animal health, uh, there are 26. Among them, eight are of genetic potential. And in joint, there is a prioritized genetic disease. In joint, we have 10. Among them, three are viral, four bacterial, and three parasitic one. And as you know, the, the country, uh, we share the, our boundaries with three, three parts with uh, three, uh, India, southern, western side, and eastern side with India, and the northern side with China. So about the policy, in principle, we have... Uh, Clear one health strategy is here. So national action plan on antimicrobial resistance. We have our own AMR. Uh, so and we have national and health policy in place, and also we have national health policy. And some policies are still uh, they are in the process of approval. We have, so these are the national rabies elimination strategy. So we. We are preparing, we have almost prepared our own health action plan and it has to be endorsed very soon. And uh, we are in the process of approval of infectious animal disease control acts. So joint external evaluation 2022 and PBS evaluation we have already conducted in 23 and now we are in the gap analysis in 25. So IHRPBR national Beijing workshop 2024 already completed. So about the pandemic for implementation, there is a clear mechanism about own, own health coordination uh, mechanism is there. So the steering committee is led by the Minister of uh, the Agriculture and Livestock Development, as well as the Honorable Minister of Health and Population. And there are secretary from different uh, stakeholder ministries. And regarding the uh, everyday activities about technical matter, we have a federal own health technical coordination committee. At the moment, the Department of Life Research as a DG, I am leading the committee. And uh, there are other department head from the health, Department of Health Sciences, Agriculture, Food Technology, Department of from National Park and Wildlife Conservation, from Environment and other, other relevant stakeholders are also there. So Animal Health and Human Health uh, chair on a rotational basis and it's our turn in this year. So we are driving from the animal health side in this year. So in, in pandemic, the name of the project is Strengthening Pandemic Preparedness for Early Detection Speed of the Projects. And obviously, uh, we have three objectives, three, uh, the three core areas, building capacity in surveillance and early warning system, improving laboratory system, and strengthening human resource and workforce. The project is officially launched on 8 May 2024 in presence of three line ministries and its department, and implementing entities, uh, the head of agencies of uh, FAO, WHO, and UNICEF. 
So the ministry involved are the Ministry of Health and Population, obvious, because we are conducting this activity in one of the approach. So we are uh, leading ministry, Minister of Agriculture and Life Development, Minister of Water Supply to conduct the, the uh, sanitation and other activities, and obvious Ministry of Finance is here. So the amount is 18.84 million US dollar, total co-financing 3.9 million US dollar, and co-investment 2.39 million US dollar. So among them, they, they, our implementing entities, the WHO, uh, side is, is 9.79 million US dollar from FEO side 4.4 million and from UNICEF is 4.64 million. So the pandemic fund steering committee headed by secretary and higher level representation from on health stakeholders such as Ministry of Agriculture and Livestock Development and Department of Livestock Services. This steering committee was formed before the project submission and the same steering committee is doing in the days. So in activity level, so work plan activities in first year implementation in animal health side, obviously EFO is implementing a partner in the animal health side. Uh, in laboratory strengthening, final report sharing workshop, of, uh, we have done the quality and assessment and already shared the report. Laboratory roadmap development workshop just completed in 5th September. So supply of laboratory equipment and supplies is already come, uh, so uh, in place. So in surveillance, sample collection, dispatch, and epidemiological reporting training for animal health professional. Yet in sort of trainings on web-based uh, NICE, National Animal Health Information System, software in uh, some of the provinces and uh, some other provinces from the Global Health Security Program as well. So avian influenza by surveillance is already initiated and the poultry biology is already initiated. In human resource, seven days laboratory placement training for veterinary technicians from veterinary laboratory already conducted. Three months EFTPP curriculum finalization workshop is already taken in 25th to 26th June. And uh, it's, it has been approved just yesterday. And now we have our own curriculum. I, I get to know from, from our colleagues. It has been approved. Now onward, we can start EFTPP training in our country with the three months curriculum. So, de so development of manual for three month FTPB program is in process. So training and need assessment of animal health professional, uh, it is in process. So work plan activities in foster implementation in human health side from WHO side. So electronic medical rec recording system implementation in Karnali, as well as Matrishisu, some other hospitals from the human health side. It's in the detection of provincial laboratories. Field epidemiology and training program roadmap development and development of a learning resource package and rapid response team. So these activities are kind of, uh, are in operations from the human health side and the implementing partner is the WHO. So in uh, the Ministry of Water Supply, the, 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 the uh, implementing partner is the UNICEF. So establishment and implementation of community-based surveillance is ongoing. It is, uh, epidemiology and disease control division of human health is, is, is implementing the community-based surveillance and they still have to pilot, uh, pilot the ministry so uh, the poor ministry they are piloting in order to conduct the activities so now the experience and strength and lesson with uh, our project is speed as you know the name of the project is speed but uh, uh, okay it has come in operation late but we are working in full swing in order to have the all activities done within the time and i'm very much thankful to fo ICTAD, and we are closely collaborating with fo ICTAD in order to conduct all these activities on times so the project implementation only initiated from mid 2024 after cabinet approval so while the anticipated start date was january 24 Project has good government ownership. So the presence of multi-sectoral steering committee facilitated the project implementation and intersectoral coordination and collaboration. So close coordination and collaboration between sectoral ministry, departments, and implementing entities during design and implementation of the plan activities. So our is the high-level political commitment there, project document endorsed by the cabinet of ministers. So uh, the, the okay, high-level uh, authorities, they know about the whatever activities going on. So good coordination between uh, the government and implementing entities. So in uh, other experience, close coordination is obvious. I have already explained. A regular meeting between government stakeholder and implementing uh, entities for implementation of the planned project activities. And One Health Strategy 2019 is a guiding document for us and which involves the multiple stakeholders for on health activities. 
So Nepal is saying women and animal preference laboratory have good intersectoral collaboration at the technical level. And uh, I'm very um, happy to share you that the most of the, our veterinary laboratory were used in order to detect the COVID, diagnose COVID during the COVID-19 outbreak. So our laboratory is, okay, we are working in the one healthy approach. So existing, we have also USAID funded global health security program. Uh, so in alignment with this spirit project, we can do better in the days to come. So, so I almost finished my presentation. I have also requested my, my, some of my colleagues you know, to include one slide of our IAE activities, and it will be the, my, my final slide. So capacity building and home research development is going on from IAE, um, so activities. So hands-on training as well as other, other trainings, uh, some early detection of animal genetic disease, such as if you If you can yeah. conclude. Uh, yeah, I have, I have almost finished, sir. So in country monitoring and fellowship program, our laboratory is changing, lots of activities is going on. And in some areas, so support for gender characters you know, of isolates from Nepal, avian influenza, LST, ASF, and rabies is going on. Support in better network participation and participation in IAA Zodiac initiative. So we are also doing our best in, uh, uh, from the uh, IAA programs in close coordination with other entities. So this is one of the program of prosiologists in animals and human, uh, humans through surveillance and control. Actually, this program is conducted by uh, one of the, our National Animal Research Council. So as per the uh, details received from them, so I have included, I have included one slide over here. So, so for their culture, almost species and genotypic of species, uh, they, they are planning. So with this, so I'm very much thankful to EFAO for this opportunity and as well as the, the uh, pandemic fund, the World Bank for this initiative and we are doing our best in order to have all these activities on time. I want to be above government of Nepal, so I assure we will complete all the activities within time with having very good results. So with this, I want to conclude my presentation. Thank you and namaste. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Umesh. Don't, don't be worried because uh, your slide will be uh, available for all participants and they will have the opportunity to see all the, the rich information that you, you, you have shared with them. Uh, thanks again to, to, to give an overview of the Pandemic Fund implementation and the process. And also, I like the name SPEED because I think one of the things that we need to do in One Health is to accelerate the implementation of One Health. And I think Speed is a good name for that. Uh, now we have um, our uh, speaker online, uh, Dr. Dr. Linda Saif from Ohio State University. And she will present on the One Health approach to preparedness and prevention of RNA virus pandemics. And she's uh, online. I hope she's connected. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to talk about um, a report that was two years in the making by an independent task force on COVID-19 and other pandemics. And this report, the full report was published in PNAS in 2022. And also I'll be using materials from a guidebook on countering zoonotic spillovers in Southeast Asia. And this is available in eight modules online. So to provide historical context, um, the emergence and repeated zoonotic uh, spillovers are shown here within approximately the last 25 years. And what, what we can see is the ones in red are in mostly endemic and repeated spillovers. And the ones um, in blue shown here, uh, blue circled, are the novel coronavirus that have emerged um, all within the past two decades. So the SARS coronavirus in 2002, and a decade later, MERS coronavirus in the Middle East, and then um, seven years later, the SARS coronavirus two. So uh, even in 2024, we've had the reemergence of virulent monkeypox strains, and then the avian H5N1 influenza in cattle. And we also see that most of these on, are on the WHO priority disease list, including the unknown disease X. So 
to prevent and prepare for these pandemics, we need to identify priority zoonotic pathogens with pandemic potential and their spillover from the host reservoir communities. So we need to first identify and prioritize these key zoonotic pathogens to focus resources. We need to understand viral populations and evolution, including evolution persistence in multi-species hosts and the dynamics of zoonotic virus emergence and re-emergence. We need to understand about the animal reservoirs and intermediate hosts for these priority zoonotic pathogens and the chains of transmission. We need to understand the viral host interactions and drivers that promote the interspecies transmission and what um, leads to the sustained host-to-host -host transmission. So we need to investigate spillovers of zoonotic viruses into multi-host species and their potential role in zoonotic spillback into humans. And I'll illustrate this with the SARS coronavirus 2 scenario. So we know that um, the lessons that we've learned from SARS, uh, this shows the natural and experimental infection in animals and a potential COVID-19 host reservoir uh, community. So the lessons we've learned that SARS has a broad host range. It can infect pets, cats and dogs. It can infect zoo animals. Um, it can infect muscolids and it can infect wildlife. So over 35 species are susceptible. Many of these are subclinical infections, except for the farm mink and cats. So this raises concerns for animal health. And these two-way arrows show the spillback that we have from cats, white-tailed deer, farm mink, and hamsters uh, from humans to the animal and then back to humans. And so this raises the question, will vaccines, as we heard yesterday about the mink vaccines, be needed to prevent new variants and spillovers? So the concern is, will there be a wildlife reservoir? Will the virus persist, adapt, and mutate the wildlife that then can transmit new variants back to humans, livestock, or other animals, establishing a host reservoir community? So we also need rapid differential economic diagnostic tests, ideally bedside or penside field tests, uh, differential tests focused on pan virus families and pan species, these should be validated for both human and animal specimens. So we could use rapid multiplexed antigen-based uh, test kits as we've done for SARS and influenza, multiplex serologic tests, and also pan virus detection platforms for detecting known and unknown viruses. And then met metagenomics or NGS for pathogen discovery. Eventually these may even be field-based systems. We need to monitor animal-human environmental interface, the One Health um, triad here, and how can we rapidly detect the zoonotic viruses and prevent their widespread transmission to humans? So this uh, schematic is by Koresh and colleagues, but it uh, illustrates One Health targeted surveillance at the animal-human um, environmental interface. So looking at the panel on the left, we see the, the reservoir hosts, usually wildlife. Some of these viruses are transmitted by vectors. The uh, viruses can spill over directly from the wildlife to humans through the vectors or through the intermediate or amplifying hosts. And these are do often domestic animals where we get amplification and then spillover and human amplification. So the control operations are on the right panel. So what we see is we could have uh, control by early detection of the human epidemic before it becomes a pandemic. We could have early detection of zoonotic spillover, or we can have generic measures to reduce the chance of zoonotic spillover or source control. So this One Health targeted surveillance is essential for situational awareness, risk assessment, and understanding the pathways of spillover which allows interventions which reduce risk. So if we look at animal surveillance, we need to prioritize the target animals, the reservoir host, often uh, birds, bats, rodents, primates, the intermediate host. We need to prioritize the geographic areas or the hotspots, and we need to prioritize what samples to collect and test. For human surveillance, we need to prioritize human sampling, especially occupational, for agriculture workers, wildlife traders, wet market, animal traders, workers, consumers, and the medical, uh, both veterinary and MDs. And we also look at 
need to look at undiagnosed or idiopathic mild cases in outpatient clinics, symptomatic hospitalized patients, and even immunocompromised patients that could be persistently infected with chronic shedding. And again, prioritize the test samples. And finally, we need regional key networks for key viruses and samples. So um, the, we can model the FAO and WHO uh, influenza and FAO centers have been also incorporated into the COVID-net um, reference centers. We have a number of biorepositories for human samples and strains, but this is largely lacking for animal samples. We also need environmental surveillance. This was very effective with SARS coronavirus 2, um, where we surveyed wastewater, sewage, bioaerosols, and transportation hubs, or even building dust. And we need uh, to implement this at the farm level for manure pits, um, common water holes, bioaerosols, or fluid ropes is diagrammed here. Um, we can implement this also in live animal markets where there are multiple species, but we can also use airborne environmental DNA monitoring to confirm the animal species presence, including illegal species that are being traded. We also need to monitor contaminated food or feed. So for humans, this is foodborne pathogens. For animals, this is largely neglected area, but we also should think about feedborne infections, especially in the wet markets um, for what the feed is for these animals. And then we need to implement risk assessments. We need to use new risk assessment tools to predict virus emergence and impact risk. And one way is to adapt the influenza risk assessment tool used for influenza to other zoonotic RNA viruses. And an example is the Global Influenza Program, where we share data globally with coordinated risk assessments to select the influenza vaccine strains. And finally, we should start applying AI to virus and risk prevention and prediction. So we are all familiar with the One Health, the concept, um, but um, the reality uh, is not really uh, yet in force, so we need to operationalize One Health. So we need to implement plans for communication, collaboration, shared resources, and coordinated actions across human, animal, both domestic and wildlife, and ecosystem health agencies at all levels to comprehensively address zoonotic pathogens. So unfortunately, wildlife health, ecosystem health, and drivers of disease emergence, such as habitat, a loss of habitats, um, extractive industries, and so forth, may not be well integrated or addressed as integral parts of one health. We need the engagement of diverse disciplines and sectors. We need to develop interagency collaboration and coordination with databases accessible to all, with integrated data sets for data collection, management, and sharing on zoonotic pathogens, both the human and animal cases and the metadata. We need sustained and equitable funding to support these integrated collaborative research on zoonotic diseases, including the animal reservoirs, the environment, and humans. And other gaps then include the resource constraints, the educational workforce development in One Health, the infrastructure, the lab diagnostic capability and biosafety, community stakeholder participation, and engagement to prevent disinformation, misinformation through social media, AI. So in summary, we need a One Health focus to control these zoonotic diseases with integrated teams of veterinary, medical, environmental, cross-disciplinary scientists, and interagency cooperation and collaboration. And with that, I'd like to thank you and acknowledge um, our lab as part of the International Reference Lab for Zoonotic Coronavirus for FAO and more recently WHO with the COVID map. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Linda uh, Saif, for for this uh, very nice uh, presentation and overview of the work and 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 the and the challenges for uh, improving uh, surveillance, in particular the animal-human environmental interface. I know that the Ohio State University is one of the FAO reference centers for. Uh, coronavirus, but also I know that uh, you are part of the WHO 
coronavirus network, then I think this uh, interface between animals, humans, and and wildlife is is very important. In how to address the the surveillance efforts at at that level, and you also mentioned sustainability and, equi and equity. I think this is a very important uh, aspect of. Uh, all the programs and how to operationalize One Health implementation in countries. We need to have sustainable funding, but also equity in, in, in the allocation of resources. Thank you, thank you very much. Now we move to the discussion and we have time for a few questions. If you have some questions, please raise your hand. And if you want to uh, make a question for the speakers, and then we will close the meeting with the, the closing remarks from our guest. Uh, please raise your hands if you if you have a question. We have uh, here Bere Bere Tecola. Uh, please Bere. Go ahead. Thank you, thank you, Julio. I'm Bere Tecola. Um, I appreciated all the presentations. By the way, fantastic, and uh, particularly the experience from Nepal and Ethiopia is just to be considered as one of the success story, but still I have a reservation on uh, the real gaps and constraints that we have at the ground level that uh, we didn't hear from, from the floor, except from Linda. So um, my, it's not a question, but uh, just to say that uh, gaps and challenges should have to be given due emphasis so as to work on their um, uh, how best we can fix them, starting from uh, financial uh, uh, resource availability all the way to political commitment and uh, political will. Policies, how best we can include the uh, One Health concepts within the curriculum of our universities and veterinary services and the likes. Other gaps, such as um, the within the country, the same country, how best we collaborate with the Ministry of Health, Ministry of Agriculture, and Ministry of, I mean, the Authority of Environmental Authorities to be really given due emphasis, which is, in reality, we don't hear each other. There is a sort of, you know, egos within their own uh, institutions, those need to be addressed properly. Yeah. Arno, yeah, Arno, finally, you mentioned the uh, the joint uh, team or groups that the three groups, you miss the uh, one of the quadripartite uh, uh, component, which is UNEP. You need to address them because I know CRAD works very closely with the environment. Thank you. Thank you very who, who wants to respond? You, Resort, or, or maybe some of our colleagues from Ethiopia or Nepal to to identify some gaps at the local level or thank you so much for pointing out the uh right things what should be done yeah ob obvious uh, yeah political community is the big issue because we have to gather the almost all the sector but there is a fix uh, not only for this uh, pandemic fund project we, ha we have a well organized the steering committee and there is a regular meeting of the steering committee chaired by the ministers of both Ministry of Agriculture and Life Development and Ministry of Health and Population along with secretaries and others it's a Committee, uh, so already on on the basis of the approved document. So, in order to discuss about the technical matters and all the activities, yeah, uh, we will lead from the Department of Life Services. And our, our implementing partner is FAO ICTAD, and we are in the same premises. And we usually, there is a frequent meeting with FAO ICTAD once in a month, at least once in a month, in order to, to have the experience sharing and the ways forward. Yeah, thank you for your suggestions. Uh, yeah, obvious, uh, the, for, for co-funding and others, we have already issued from the government of Nepal, so there is no any co-funding other issues. I think we, we don't have any issues in Nepal, uh, and we are, our ICTA team is over here as well, so, so we, we both, we have to drive the projects. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your suggestions.
Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, yeah. Some... Yes, we have. Ah, you you want to? Okay. I'm going to. Okay. Uh, with the issues raised by how to uh, include the uh, One Health concept in the curriculum, it will be, I think, the next agenda. I will take it as an assignment. But uh, uh, with regards in the context of Ethiopia, in One Health approach, uh, I would like to share the experience we had. So uh, with the current arrangements, the main actors are the Ministry of Environment, Ministry of Health, Ministry of Agriculture uh, and uh, Wildlife. But uh, some 10 years before, uh, there had been a critical issue in Ethiopia, which was already well taken at the level of parliament. At that time, there was a disease uh, which seriously affects uh, liver uh, in the northern part of Ethiopia. And uh, it was a, a uh, serious problem, and it was classified as unknown liver disease. During that time, we have established the National Task Force, experts drawn, drawn from different institutes. And uh, at the end of that investigation, we find that the main reason for that liver disease was a herb, a weed. And uh, the animal feed on that feed will, I mean, transmit to the uh, end user, I mean, the consumer. So you can Google it as unknown liver disease in the northern part of Ethiopia. So what we learned from this experience, we have to bring on board additional experts. During that mission, we brought on board chemists, even uh, plant protection experts from different sectors. That really uh, gave us a great lesson. So based on this, we wish to widen the scope of uh, One Health in order to bring additional experts, even including the plant sector. Uh, in this context, we are always referring to those uh, feed of animal origin. But the main uh, mm, food our people are uh, rely on is the uh, plant origin. So if we are talking about food safety, if we are about talking about One Health, we have to bring on board those experts from the plant sector. This is, my, uh, this is our suggestion. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. We have a one May question there. Oh. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. So mine is to thank all the presenters. Yeah, but one thing we have had a lot of presentations, quite good ones and initiatives, a lot of abbreviations. So mine is to all the panelists. My fear is the area of duplication and for lack of a better word, confusion. We have a lot of it at the global level, regional level, even at national level. So what's the level of collaboration and coordination? And I think Linda mentioned that at the end. So my fear is the duplication effects. See, yeah. So, uh, yes, you can. Thank you very much. Um, I think it's a great question. Uh, we heard before there are more or less around 400 initiative activities of. Uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, there are around 400 initiative uh, projects uh, with relation to uh, prevention of zoonotic diseases all over the world on different levels. So the work what we do in Frizod is really to bring them together, to bring them under one roof, to exchange as much as possible uh, all the experience coming from different parts of the world, from different levels, from governmental levels to really to uh, community in front lines level, in between also to bring together uh, scientific uh, organization, academia, governments and also industry. So a lot of expert experience and expertise to combine them together to make sure it work according to the One Health concept and approach. And One Health concept and approach right now, it's a very good idea, but in order to really to take it to the next steps, we need to implement it. We need to really structure it at the governmental level and other structure that in, will be in the end of the day really will be able to use it in practice in order to advance research, to advance uh, advocacy, and to advance um, all the ex 
uh, all the work is done in order to hopefully to prevent the next pandemic through the prevention of zoonotic diseases. Thank you, Zip. And we have, yes, very short, please. Uh, so a quick one. So I think regarding some of the challenges that we've noted so far and regarding uh, duplication, <clears throat> I think we've learned from the PAMA side, we've learned from the first round of projects that were approved. We approved the projects in uh, July last year, but as you heard from Ethiopia, they actually started implementation in May this year. So it's taken several months for them to uh, do the impl uh, start the implementation. After the grants are approved, we have to go through processes, signing the agreements, what have you. And those are some of the things that we've realized that takes a while. So I think we've tried to streamline the post-approval processes so that in the next round, we wouldn't run into some of those uh, issues. Having said that, I think we heard from the two presenters about setting up committees, tech technical working groups, what have you. Those, those are some of the things that we can start as soon as the project is a grant is approved. Once we start that process, it jump starts the processes. And then by the time we receive the funds, you are ready um, to take off. Regarding duplication of activities, yes, that is true. But I think on the flip side, we realize that even the process of developing the proposal, several sectors come together to develop the proposals and they come together for the implementation. So one of the positive effects that we've realized is that actually is helping to streamline and help with the collaboration and coordination at the country level. Thank you. Thank you. We have one question over there and then here. And then I think we need to close. Yeah, first uh, I would like to thank the panelists and uh, the chair for um, this beautiful uh, presentation. My question is, uh, because we are here under the One Health umbrella, and um, my question will go to the Nepalese presenter. They have Isabet, and they have also EPTF. As far as I can recall, in 2008 in Nigeria, or 2009, we created a unit called EPTV, EPTFV. We added the V so that the previous EPT was just medical doctors. So we said, well, in one terms, in the name of One Health, we included veterinarians. So we had about 10 medical doctors and two veterinarians included in that program. And uh, it's, it was funded by the USAID. And then uh, FAO came with Isavet. So I don't see the difference between the two in the first of all. And secondly, uh, Nepal is now trying to have the two programs running in parallel. Is that one health or doesn't it go contrary to the spirit? Thank you. Thank, thank you, sir, for your suggestion. Especially, yeah, till now, uh, regarding the field diploma training program for veterinarian, we didn't have the, the curriculum and the training in, in Nepal. So we used to send our officials to abroad, Thailand, and others in order to, to have their course. Now it's in place. The curriculum is already approved, and we'll train a number of veterinarians in order to uh, have joint surveillance mechanism in, in close coordination with many health people. So, yeah, obviously, uh, at, at the moment, uh, yeah, uh, some programs is going on from the uh, USAID funded uh, global security programs. And we definitely, we, we have a fixed, uh, we regularly will monitor, we will uh, plan accordingly. As for the, in which area the, the, the global health security program will address and in which area the pandemic fund address so that we can have a robust system in one health in the days to come. So, uh, so there is no any issues of duplication because we, we frequently used to sit together in order to, to, to have the work plan in place, sir. Thank you. Thank you for the suggestion. Thank you. Just uh, to add on 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 your questions about FETP, FETPV, Isabet program, I think um, uh, the 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 support from FAO to Philip epidemiology training program 
has been through different type of uh, initiatives. One is, as you mentioned, FETPV, and we have a very good experience of uh, FAO supporting FETPV programs in Asia since 2010, 2009, uh, which is a very successful regional program for FETPV in, in that region supported by FAO. But at the same time, we have a very good initiative with ISABET uh, through the ECTAD program that has been supporting frontline uh, uh, FETPV programs in, in countries. All these programs are following the traditional FETP model, which is uh, frontline level, intermediate level, and advanced level. I think we are not discovering nothing new. Is is we are just uh, adapting an existing concept and approach to the veterinary world, to the animal health uh, work, etc. But the names can change. But I think what is important is the approach is the same, and all ISABET programs, all FETPV programs supported by FAO, are following a, ve a very clear core of set of core competencies for field epidemiologists to learn at the front line, intermediate and advanced levels. I think just, just for clarification, we are not talking about different things. It's the same thing with different names. We have the last question and then we, we go to the closing. Yes, Madam, please. You. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm uh, Nuele Mtui from Zambia, EFO Zambia. And uh, uh, maybe what I wanted to contribute has already been spoken by uh, uh, panelists from uh, Nepal uh, with regard to the um, uh, importance of engaging the stakeholders at the For example, but in Zambia, we are implementing both GHSP uh, and um, uh, uh, pandemic fund uh, project and what we did maybe I can share only for with regard to lab uh, capacity building and for us what we've uh, come up to uh, as our option is like pandemic fund is supporting from uh, provincial level to uh, central level uh, like the national uh, central veterinary laboratory but then for pandemic is going more to the uh, lower, lower level, like a district level uh, point of entries and uh, veterinary campsites. So with that separation, it means at the end of the day, you have capacity built from a uh, very low level up to the central level. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for this. And I think there are a few questions uh, from our colleagues that are connected online. Uh, very interesting question, but uh, we commit to respond all the questions we will give to the to our speaker, and they will they will uh, answer later. Thank you very much for your questions to those colleagues that are connected online. Now we have to conclude this event. I think it will be a very important discussion, some very rich discussion in this uh, uh, hour, and I will give the floor to Biscam again, and and Biscam will. Uh, provide some closest remarks from the Joint Center. Thank you, Biscam. Thank you, Chair. And thank you very much, uh, all of you, for coming here today, because today is the best day to um, uh, invest our minds, uh, brains on this topic, because if we talked about One Health approach to combat pandemics uh, four years, five years ago, I don't think there wouldn't be an um, event here or, or this kind of an audience. So thank you very much. We understand the, the importance of these kind of uh, events. And then um, one thing that uh, picking up from the audience about the, the duplication of the activities, I think it's a very good point that you raised. But I also would like to mention that sometimes it's not the duplication that we try to do or, or we the answer to the duplication is the synergy and complement. So that's that's what we have to do. And in order to do that, we have to, to operate not in silos, but in in in, in um, uh, getting together uh, international organization, national organizations operating internationally in, in these kind of events where we have a good dialogue and do good discussion on that. So thank you very much. We acknowledge, but we have done some work, but we are we have to do more. 
And then um, another point uh, that I picked up from the, the panelists, uh, from the speakers, is uh, workforce development, uh, which was mentioned by Nepal, uh, Ethiopia, as well as my colleague from FAO. Uh, this is a very important aspect. When we talked about workforce uh, development, it does not reflect on scientists. It does not reflect on technicians or other um, uh, entities within within laboratories or um, uh, relevant organizations. But it involves also other the policy from policymakers to the other. Um, uh, uh, professionals who are involved in, in such activities. We need to um, increase the capacity of uh, all those sectors. So those two um, points I want to highlight. And then uh, finally, I, I, I would like to mention that um, we as uh, SODIAC, we are also involved in, in uh, Pandemic Fund. Thank you very much for investing on that. And that's where we, uh, through FAO, we are stepping in to help countries like Nepal or countries like Zambia. We have good discussions, and then we come in at the at the point where we find the gaps to fill, and uh, we are working there. Thank you very much, and I pass the floor to my colleague to compliment on on the uh, closing remarks. Thank you very much, and now we give the floor to Sid. So he will close this event. So thank you very much for the honor to close this event. So first of all, I would like to thank to all the panelists and speakers for the great presentations. I would like also to thank to the audience for your questions, to the good discussions. We have a lot to reflect on, and we are looking very much forward also to answer questions from home. So it's a great opportunity, the FAO, and together with Zodiac to organize this and co-organize this event today. The idea of this event is really to raise the importance of the concept and the approach of One Health. Uh, but of course, we need to work hard in order to put it in practice, in order to allow us to walk and to advance uh, in order to prevent uh, emerging of zoonotic disease and reduce the risks for human population of pathogens coming uh, from animals. So I hope this event today will help all of us to really to, to get closer together in the future, more collaboration, more communication, more understanding what is available there in order to avoid as much as possible duplication of projects and activities around the world. So we really need to know what's happening in order to enhance synergies and see where we can complement one each other, the different projects. So I think uh, it's important to involve all stakeholders from all levels, from governments to communities in the front lines in order to be able really to achieve this hopefully ambitious goal to prevent the next pandemic. Thank you very much. Thank you. And finally, we thank all of you for being here and be patient with the time and our speakers and I, I ask you for a round of applause for them and, and, and to close the event. Thank you very much. And you can have some lunch, I think, outside.